the entity that's introduced himself to you uh, is presented as an alien from another world. The fact is, that's not even true. Never has been true. That's that's the the cover story for the alien. He wants you to believe he's an alien from another planet. The fact is, he isn't. Anyway, I said, uh, for instance, the little gray alien. I said uh, he's got an IQ of about eighty. That's a moron. What alien comes from another world, from a far distant star system, that's got an IQ of a moron? That doesn't even make sense. How do you know they're like a moron? I said, because they can't even get your clothes on right. They put you in the wrong bed sometimes, the wrong house, sometimes the wrong car. They drop people off in the wrong locations. In one case we have, with two witnesses, they dropped them off in the wrong state come toward me, paralyzed me at that point. And when he, when he did, I was, uh, I fell back on the bed. I was so shocked. I'd never felt fear like that in my entire life. I mean, the fear was horrific. I fell back on the little bed and I pushed so hard against the bed so he couldn't get near me. The bed split, uh, moved apart from the wall, the little tiny cot, and uh, it pushed the bed apart. And I fell down and bounced my little head off the floor and it was a ki every kid's nightmare. It picked up the covers of the bed and lifted them up and stuck its huge head under the bed right next to my face. Who is the alien? Tell me who the alien is. Well, they're interdimensional beings. They're, um, they're space beings from Jupiter. They're space beings from multiple, multiple dimensions. They're time travelers. Really? They're all of those? What if they're not? When you look at the um, um, <clears throat> the uh, praying mantis is a good example. He's, uh, the, the, these are and the, and the alien story. If you look at it from the viewpoint I'm giving it to you here, um, it's proof that if if evolution did exist, it doesn't with the alien for sure. Because how do you get a seven foot tall praying mantis with an IQ of about 180? How does that happen? Hmm. It you might tend to notice that there's a mistake in that. Uh, you know, you get dropped off and you get picked up in Colorado and dropped off in Dalhart, Texas. You might notice there's a, a problem with that story, and uh, especially when there are engineers involved, and that just it, it just blows people's minds. Well, the reason is because the that particular alien that drops you off or picks you up which I call the cosmic pizza delivery guy, and you're the pizza. I, it basically amounts to, <clears throat> how shall I say it? Um, he makes mistakes. He's only got an IQ of 80. He remembers kind of where he picked you up, and so he's going to put you back approximately where you got. And uh, you're close. <clears throat> the alien functions like an intelligence community. They we in the CIA, we had what we call cover stories. The alien has cover stories as well. Their biggest cover story is called a screen memory. It's a pictorial uh, and a, a very powerful feeling of, of, of an event that occurred that didn't occur like you think it did. It, that's the whole point of it. Your friend, uh, your late friend dr carla turner called it the virtual reality syndrome or something like that it is something it, like it, that she, yeah. she was absolutely right about that it's uh it's uh, nonsensical stories uh, it can be uh your child got picked up by uh, casper the friendly ghost he's pure white with large black eyes uh it doesn't make any difference what imagery they use it's imagery that you trust well the next morning we were walking and uh, he looked at me and said something that bothered me to no end. He said, uh, Dad, they, what they did to me changed my consciousness. Now, how in the world a kid six years old explain something like that to an adult? He said, uh, I no longer care for people like I did. And, uh, and I knew, I knew who, who it was that did that because he was, 
one of the beings that was in my room that last night in my last event. How did that make so, you feel? How did that make you uh, feel, Daryl? I, I, I went from a concerned father to an alien hunter on the spot. Beyond the Forbidden. Welcome to Beyond the Forbidden. Today on the show, I got somebody that I believe this is my fourth time to interview him. The first time was in person at the Scott Answer UFO conference back in 2018, I believe. But Daryl, Daryl Sams, the alien hunter. Welcome back to Beyond Forbidden. How you been, man? I'm delighted to be here. So you've been, we've been kind of emailing a little bit back and forth. I don't know, trying to set something up, say at least the past, probably since October-ish, maybe November-ish. Mm-hmm. And I know you've been really busy. So what's been going on in, in the, the world of the alien hunter? Oh, a, a lot of uh, evidentiary work. Uh, <laughs> I've got um, uh, several major finds that I, I want to explore, and it's going to take about close to hundred thousand dollars to uh, exploit them. And uh, so, anyway, I'm just looking for a, <clears throat> someone to finance the operation without uh, trying to take the lion's share, so to speak. Mm. But uh, anyway, they're uh, just uh, Im- important finds that uh, that I think will shake the uh, UFO community pretty well. Regarding the abduction research, correct? That too. Oh, that too. Okay. All right then. Well, well, keep keep me keep me updated then. Whenever, whenever that time comes, whenever you can spill some more information out there, unless there's some, maybe a few little nuggets you can, little breadcrumbs you can give us. Well, they, uh, that, there's a, a group that invited me to uh, Seattle to their uh, UFO conference uh, and do the, uh, be one of the primary speakers there. And then um, they said, we would like to invite you to our uh, Sasquatch conference. And uh, I said, that's fine. Uh, I can do that as well. I said, do you know anything about it? And I said, well, Probably not as uh, not, not as focused on that as I am other things. I said, but I've had hair samples since 1989, and uh, I've got a urine sample and a fingernail sample from a uh, adolescent. So I said, I guess I'm doing all right. <laughs> um, what when is that conference taking place? The one in Seattle? Uh, that's uh, that you would ask. That's all already on my web uh, down on my Facebook site. Okay. Uh, go to Facebook, the Alien Hunter, Daryl Sims, and uh, you'll find it up there. It's uh, uh, it's good night. That's um, uh, that's gonna be a, it's gonna be a, a very good conference. I'll be there. Uh, Mike Barra will be there, and several other people. So it's um, it's gonna be it's gonna be decent. Really, really gonna be good. So our interview that we did in person back at the Scott Answer UFO conference, uh, I remember you saying that and that interview it's it's done really well gotten a lot of feedback off the interview since then um remember you st- stating something along the lines of the aliens are made hatched and cloned or manufactured for the purpose or something like that That's um correct. i don't know if i asked you on the last interview or not i don't remember daryl um uh, that that we did actual podcast uh last year but what is that purpose i know that might be a big you know that's a lot of rabbit holes probably to go down but what what is the purpose and i don't i don't think i asked you that in that in-person interview but but yeah what's that purpose because i've actually had a few people respond back like that they wish i would have 
asked. And I don't think I did, even on the podcast that we did last year. But yeah, go ahead, Daryl. Well, it would take a whole show to do to, to even answer the question. And I'll get into why that is in a moment. But uh, in a nutshell, um, it's my um, thesis based on 50 years research that the uh, entities that we're looking at, the seven primary entities, the little gray, the tall gray, the Nordic, the Bigfoot, the um, reptile, the praying mantis, and so on, are beings that have been made, hatched, cloned, or manufactured for the purpose of uh, making us believe something else. And uh, in fact, it's, <laughs> I've often said this, uh, having been in the CIA myself uh, for years, uh, back in the Vietnam War, I've told people that it's um, the, the alien functions like an intelligence community. They lie and they lie consistently, just like we did in the CIA, the Mossad, the KGB. It doesn't make any difference. The purpose of an intelligence community is to gather information and to make you believe something else about what we do and specifically what's not true. Uh, I mean, the, the sad way of looking at it is uh, basically you hired us to lie to you. Not to the world, but to you too. And uh, the, uh, for instance, uh, on a practical level, how your audience might entertain that is um, how'd you like the Roswell story? It was a weather balloon. Yeah. And if you didn't like that, we had three other stories for you as well. It didn't make any difference. Salt gas. It didn't happen <laughs> three or four different ways. It happened only one way, but it doesn't matter. You just keep telling stories and people will gravitate to the one that they like best. And that's the way the intelligence community works. Well, the alien isn't any different. They function the same way. And uh, people kind of like, they think they understand what you just said. And uh, we'll let's let's play it and see if it works. <clears throat> the alien functions like an intelligence community. They, we in the CIA, we had what we call cover stories. The alien has cover stories as well. Their biggest cover story is called a screen memory. It's a pictorial uh, and a, a very powerful feeling of 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 an event that occurred that didn't occur like you think it did. It, that's the whole point of it. Your friend, uh, your late friend, Dr. Carla Turner called it the virtual reality syndrome or something like that. It is. Something it, like it, that. She, yeah. she was absolutely right about that. It's a, uh, it's a nonsensical story. So it can be, uh, your child got picked up by a Casper, the friendly ghost. He's pure white with large black eyes. Uh, it doesn't make any difference what imagery they use. It's imagery that you trust or that you feel it's nonsensical. It couldn't possibly be true. But the fact is, it was true. It wasn't a ghost, but it was something else. And uh, how that plays out from the alien point of view, I can point to my own case and when I was four years old, the same way that the stories don't vary that much. They, It's the same thing. The entity that's introduced himself to you uh, is presented as an alien from another world. The fact is, that's not even true. Never has been true. That's that's the, the cover story for the alien. He wants you to believe he's an alien from another planet. The fact is, he isn't. If you look at the DNA, even a cursory look from a, a medical view, of the each of these beings, you'll see clearly that there is in fact no such thing as a um, that you can't prove that they, they're aliens from other worlds by looking at their exterior, so to speak. And, and I will, I'll carry this out to lo its logical conclusion. Um, we'll take a few examples. Uh, someone challenged me on this on a show I did. Uh, in England, and they said, well, you're wrong. And I said, no, I'm actually right. I said, but it'll probably take you about 10 years to figure it out. 
but that's okay. I said, I've been doing this for a long time. I don't jump to conclusions or pick out a, an over, interesting view because I, I like it. Over that, 40 that years, right, Daryl? Yeah. Yes. Over 40 years. So, uh, anyway, I said, uh, for instance, a little gray alien. I said, uh, he's got an IQ of about 80. That's a moron. What alien comes from another world, from a far distant star system, that's got an IQ of a moron? That doesn't even make sense. Well, how do you know they're like a moron? I said, because they can't even get your clothes on right. They put you in the wrong bed sometimes, the wrong house, sometimes the wrong car. They drop people off in the wrong locations. In one case we have, with two witnesses, they dropped them off in the wrong state. Hmm. It You might tend to notice that there's a mistake in that. that you know, you get dropped off and... You get picked up in Colorado and dropped off in Dalhart, Texas. You might notice there's a, a problem with that story. And uh, especially when engineers involved and that just, it, it just blows people's minds. Well, the reason is because the, that particular alien that drops you off or picks you up, which I call the cosmic pizza delivery guy, and you're the pizza, I, it basically amounts to, <clears throat> How shall I say it? Um, he makes mistakes. He's only got an IQ of 80. He remembers kind of where he picked you up, and so he's going to put you back approximately where you got. And uh, your clothes are often removed in the event, and sometimes they put the other guy, if there's two of you, there's sometimes they'll put the other guy's clothes on you because he won't remember that those are not yours. Uh, in one case, we had a little girl uh, a real small young girl was in the abduction, and so was a military guy. She came home with his field jacket, and he left with her little tiny T-shirt. You can imagine how he felt trying to get that thing on. It barely would fit his hand and his arm, much less him. And when he came, she came back, her parents freaked out. said, where did you get this? And she said, I don't know. And uh, again, they make mistakes. So to begin with, the uh, the small alien, the small gray, has an IQ of about 80. He's not very smart. He's made that way on purpose. He's made, hatched, cloned, and constructed that way to do a certain job, and that's all. The taller gray being that uh, is the boss, or some people refer to him as the doctor, so to speak, that guy has got an IQ of about 135, 140. He's, he's very smart. And uh, he knows what he's doing. Uh, the little gray being is, they're always afraid of him because he's the boss. He is it. And uh, it would uh, behoove them to not make mistakes around him because he can get rid of you very easily because there, there are a million of them like, like them. They're just like toasters. And, you know, if you make mistakes around them, they just get rid of you and get another one. They can care yeah. less. <laughs> so these guys live in fear of their life, literally. When you look at the um, um, <clears throat> the uh, praying mantis is a good example. He's, uh, the, the, these are in the, in the alien story. If you look at it from the viewpoint I'm giving it to you here, um, it's proof that if if evolution did exist, it doesn't with the alien for sure. Because how do you get a seven foot tall praying mantis with an IQ of about 180? How does that happen? I would guess by listening and to a lot of your lectures and interviews that he was made hatch cloned or manufactured. That's exactly right. So the question is, where do you get praying mantis DNA? Probably not from Zeta Reticuli, probably not from Mars, probably not from the moon, but we have several hundred species of praying mantises on planet Earth. If you want to uh, take that DNA and create, hatch, clone, make, or manufacture another being. It's called transgenics, and you can actually do that. It works. <clears throat> another illustration is the uh, the reptile being. Good example. They say, well, well, you know, there's so many different kinds. These are all races of beings. I said, no, they're not. They're models, like in a car company. If you go to the Chevy company, you look at this 
the cheap end of the cars, you'll see a Chevette down there. You look at the high end, you'll see a Corvette Stingray. In between, there's all these models. That's exactly what you're looking at with the Alien. These are just models. They're not races of anything. They're hatch clone made manufactured for the purpose of making you think they came from another planet. They don't. Now, the interesting thing about the reptile is uh, somebody's questioning me about, about this one time. And they said, well, what about the reptile? And I said, what about him? I said, uh, well, we just, uh, these things are, they're just, uh, they're, they're from other planets. And I said, really? I said, uh, I said, remember uh, reading in the uh, in a Bible, actually, in the third chapter of Genesis, about this reptile guy come walking in the Garden of Eden. Do you want to help support Beyond Forbidden and receive extra content that's not seen anywhere else? By becoming a patron, a few things you will receive are the full-length 90-minute or 120-minute podcast episode. Members will also receive a private link of the video podcast and will only be exclusive to Patreon members in-person face-to-face interviews with some of the most well-known respected researchers behind the scenes footage of interviews not seen anywhere else and that's just a few perks so what do you have to lose cut out one brain rotting overly processed happy meal a month that doesn't do anything beneficial for your mind body and spirit and become a patreon for just five bucks what what do you say with that interesting character i said he's standing there talking to her he's got a incredible IQ and so smart he completely fooled the first woman and uh, and deceived those two and my point is that uh, there he is right in the Garden of Eden so if you think this stuff hadn't been around for a while you you're the only one missing the point as then you've got the human being like entity they have called the Nordic I said, he's a, uh, I said, I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess at where you might get Nordic DNA. Hmm. How about Norway? That probably would be a good guess. The point is that they're, uh, this is one of the reasons, in my opinion, the Nazis were so bent on creating a super race of blonde haired and blue eyed people because they had already seen them. They, in fact, were the Nordics. And, uh, in fact, other people had seen them as well um, in the military. And it's a, a, a provable fact. Um, and uh, you ever heard of the, uh, the uh, naval operations and air operations in Antarctica and also the, in uh, the Arctic under uh, a particular uh, rear admiral? Yeah, Bird. That's exactly correct. He went and saw them, met with them, and was stunned by their looks and so on. By the Nordics? Yeah, exactly. And uh, he saw the, the, the gray style alien and so on. He was, uh, I'm just saying, they've been around for a while, and uh, there's, a, there's a reason for that. The question is, why would someone go out and hash clone make ma- manufacture these entities introduce them as aliens to humans. What's the point? Somebody's in the business of deception. Intelligence communities are in the business of deception. That's what they do. That's the name of the game. And uh, they do real well at it. In my presentation, uh, the one I just recently did in Manchester, England, they were asking some questions, and I said, well, I use seven hats to answer questions. I said, uh, "I said my investigative process works seven different ways, in, in effect. Literally, I uh, everybody's got a UFO hat. And by that, I mean a UFO hat is a lot of fun to wear. I got one, but everybody does. If you like UFOs or into that sort of thing, you have a UFO hat. That's mine that's, right there, Daryl. That's the only <laughs> only problem with that hat is it gets fooled real easily. There have been people who fooled us in times past and still do it. Some of them still doing it. And they get away with it because the UFO hat will buy into just about any story you want to make up or send out there. The second hat, which I hope your audience will 
attempt to put on today, so to speak, is the cop hat. As a former cop and a detective, uh, my job was to uh, to use a different type of thinking when I'm investigating cases, as an example. I got over 2,000 cases worldwide, and I've interviewed tens of thousands of people over the years. And I can assure you, uh, when the cop hat gets on, it's one that most people don't like. It looks at you like you're the perp, and it doesn't really... It's more interested in the facts of the story rather than your opinion, because uh, that really doesn't mean a whole lot. And uh, so the cop hat is extremely investigative. It has its own skills. It's very, very effective. We have several levels of that that we can get into. Then we have the uh, medical and psych hat. Uh, the medical is where we, like if we're studying implants or this sort of thing, doing a surgery, that's where that hat comes into play. But so does the psychological, because when we uh, you fill out our forms and so on and uh, do that sort of thing, um, there's a psychological and a medical aspect uh, and a cop hat all are in, involved in those forms. I don't and know the, if I told you last time, Darryl, my wife is a psych nurse and I was military police. I've told you that before. Oh yeah. Uh, and my wife's a psych nurse. I don't know if I, she's told me a lot of, I try to learn a lot of things that she's learned over the years, you know, with that. And it can, it can be very helpful. And you it did is. a lot of, you did a lot of that in intelligence also. That's correct. And so I incorporate a lot of that into our, uh, of our forms. So when people pull them out, they, uh, They'll often, uh, if they're real abductees, they'll usually say, it's like you're reading my mail. How do you know all this weird stuff? <laughs> so, because I'm one of you. That's why. <laughs> and uh, so we have a medical hat and a psych hat, and then uh, you got a science hat. In other words, when the implants or something like that is found and we begin to study it, we take it to the, to the science level. And the science hat, when it gets on, it's uh, probably the most unfriendly of all the hats. It doesn't. Um, it's it's pure. It's pure science. It doesn't care about anything else. Then we've got an intelligence hat. What's an intelligence hat? That's a hat basically that deceives. That's what it does. Uh, the aliens got one, so to speak. That's why they're so good at what they do. They got people out there believing they're aliens from other planets. I mean, name one person out there that doesn't believe that. They either believe they're from another planet or they're from another dimension or a uh, time traveler or something, but it, anything except the real thing. The fact is that they're hatch clone made and manufactured for a specific purpose, and that's to see you. Then outside that, we've got a Native American hat. Native American hat is a hat that has, uh, in my, my roots, and uh, it, it has a different perspective of looking at things. It really does. Then we've got a spiritual hat which is not psychic it's not the uh the religious stuff and so on it's strictly uh, spirituality and it looks at things totally now all these hats when i every time i'm reviewing a case or information or evidence all those hats are on at the same time and they don't all agree with each other they have different viewpoints and that's okay with me but when people ask me a question like I want you to tell me what the real story is on the alien. I have to determine what hat that person's wearing or can even live with before I can even answer the question. I was just about to ask and, you that, Daryl. How, how, how do you differentiate or how do you determine which hat to put on? You know, well, if, they, if they've got a, a, a UFO hat on, uh, they're going to they're going to have to get something just slightly better than the UFO hat answer. That's all. They're not going to be able to deal with. Uh, 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 a spiritual hat or a Native American uh, hat, and uh, the intelligence hat, they're not going to like at all. That, that No, no, I ain't, they're not going to deal with that at all. Uh, no, nobody's deceiving me. <laughs> <laughs> it take you about 25 years to wake up. You know? uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, this is, if you, if someone is uh, in the, let's say, uh, uh, is a UFO, they got a UFO hat, but they're a, 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 a psychologist as an example. 
I debate these people all the time. And uh, they want an answer based on a psychological answer based on wearing their UFO hat. Hmm. And and if you don't give them that answer, I, 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 <laughs> this is funny. Uh, I had the, I did a presentation for a for a group uh, back in the Northwest uh, about a year ago, and they had an MD on there, so I knew I was going to have to answer medical. It's got to be medical, and it's got to be strictly from their viewpoint. I knew that right off the bat, and they had an engineer, so I knew that I had to have a science hat for that one. And then the investigator, she was a really nice lady. I liked her a lot. Uh, she had kind of a cop UFO hat, kind of. And so that's how you had to answer all the questions. Well, the doctor, the MD, got into it with me right off the bat, said, well, I just don't, I just don't see, I don't see that at all. And I said, okay, tell me what part you're, you disagree, all of it. I said, okay, uh, could you be more specific? Well, I just don't believe there are hats clone made manufactured. And I said, okay, uh, tell me where you get a seven foot praying mantis from. Total silence. Where do you get a reptile that talks and can outsmart people? Because he only wears one hat. Well, I mean, that. So, uh, she, so anyway, I knew that the only way I could help her out there was to just start go, getting into the implants and getting medical with it. So she, well, that, this means that. And I said, um, with great respect, I said, uh, I've been involved in 27 of those surgical interventions and I'm very familiar with uh, that phenomenon. And uh, you aren't, so I'm gonna take my view over yours. I'm an, I'm an MD, I said, with great respect. I said, I work with cardiovascular surgeons, brain surgeons, and others. These are people, and you know it, you couldn't carry their luggage. These are fellows in their own industry. They're not the local MD. And I said, no, I don't mean that with downgrading you or anyone else. I'm just telling you, I've worked with some very high class people and uh, I couldn't carry their luggage. I said, make no mistake about it. I said, but whenever we go into that surgical OR, we look at those x-rays and MRIs, they ask me the question, what do you want to do? What is that thing? How does it function? How, how do we remove that? What do we do? What, what, is there what kind we don't know what to do there we can cut it out but that doesn't mean anything i said well you could destroy it if you do it wrong that's why you're here you to tell us what to do so that's what i do i said so when i say that i'm i say that with uh with uh with respect to you in the medical field but your area of the medical field uh may not reach into that realm well she didn't like that at all Woo. oh she got hot <laughs> Well, uh, uh, well, uh, I said, in fact, like usually there's a biological membrane around a lot of these objects, dense, dark membrane. And she's, well, that's, a uh, that's from, uh, uh, that's an inflammatory process. And I said, that's what most doctors would say. What we found is that wasn't the case at all. What? I said, I told 250 surgeons at John Muir Medical Hospital in a presentation I did before we ever did any surgeries in 1994. I gave them five things that we would find if these implants are really alien. One of them, there'd be no signs of technology whatsoever. Two, the, there would be a biological encasement, and that encasement would not be native to that part of the body. Like what? And I, I, swear, I said, the dense dark membrane was not a uh, inflammatory response, either chronic or acute. It, in fact, was keratin. Keratin is your hair, your fingernails, your surface skin. That's it. Hmm. Well, how could that be? I said, that's what everybody else was asking after we did the first surgery. How could you possibly know when you've never done a surgery before? How would you know that? I said, because I was there. I was a recipient of an alien implant at age four, excuse me, age 12. 
And uh, so I, maybe I ought to back up just a little bit to help out the audience a little bit. Uh, my own event happened, uh, started in 1952 at age four. And uh, what had happened is the entity had already placed me back in bed. He had taken me through the wall, put me back in bed. And uh, I had this propensity to switch on when something's wrong. I've done even done that in surgery. I was uh, in a general surgery with a general anesthesiologist and two uh, specialists at um, at a hospital here in Houston. And I sensed something wrong, and I just opened my eyes and, and set up and scared the anesthesiologist half to death. He thought he was going to get sued because the anesthesia wasn't working. Oh, and wow. I... I asked my doctor, I said, who is that guy? Now I was talking about the other doctor who was there. Right? Somebody was in the room. I didn't know. And he said, that's Dr. So-and-so. I said, well, Dr. Albina, I said, what's his job? He said, uh, uh, uh. I said, well, basically what you've done is sub out the work to someone else because you're not qualified to do a chemical pain injection. He said, uh, yes, that's true. I said, okay, I just wanted to know. I think I'll go back to sleep now. And he says, please do. And I laid back down and the anesthesia worked fine. My point is that I have this propensity to switch on whenever something I sense, sense something's wrong. And that, I, I found that out at age uh, four in that event because what happened uh, is I was laying in bed. I sensed something wrong. I opened my eyes rapidly. And I saw it walking away from me back toward the wall. He was going to walk through it. I didn't know that. I had no memory of it. I mean, I just, he, he told me I wouldn't remember, and I didn't. So I saw him walking away, and I thought to myself in my head, who is that? What's he doing in my room? It's freezing under. It's cold. What's he going to bump into the wall? And uh, instantly he turned around. Now, I said that to myself in my head. He heard every word. So I learned something about him real quick. What kind of being or entity was this? It was a gray alien, about uh, about four foot tall, uh, with perfectly round eyes, not the, the elliptical version like you see in Hollywood. But they, uh, this was 1952, and uh, his eyes were perfectly round, about an inch and a half across, little pinholes for a nose, no ears. A slip for a mouth, and he never moved his mouth. The, everything I heard, I heard in my head, both to skull to skull contact, so to speak. And the next thing he realized at that point, I heard him say something, which is rather weird, uh, because I heard in my head him speaking. He said, "It's awake." I realized he's talking about me because there wasn't anybody else in that room but me. And uh, he said, I've it, never he, he said, it's awake like you're it's. a lab rat. Exactly. I'm, and so I was uh, amazed at the, the whole thing because how uh, to my, I'd never heard anybody else's voice in my head but mine. Now I'm hearing someone else's and he's talking about me. <laughs> and, uh, at that point, I'm not, I'm not paralyzed, not scared, not anything. I just can't figure this guy out. And kids look at things differently. And this is important for the audience to understand this. When I looked at him, I started with his eyes, which were stunning. They were very controlling. And I went, saw his nose, went down his lips, his bony little neck, skinny little body. And he didn't have any clothes on. And that was I was amazed because it was wintertime, cold, freezing, and I thought, well, what in the world? How can this be? And uh, my eyes went down. He didn't have any mammary glands. He didn't have a belly button. He didn't have a TT. Mm. Now, little kids would notice stuff like that. The adults probably wouldn't. They'd say, oh, my gosh, you're an alien from another planet. Well, kids are a little more definitive about things like that. And... Uh, now, years later, as I reviewed that event, as I became an investigator, I realized he didn't have a belly button because he wasn't born. His maid hatch cloned. 
manufacturing. He didn't have genitalia because he didn't get here the same way we did. He they don't procreate. So how does that ha- what ha- what does that mean? It means he was hatch cloned, made or manufactured for some particular reason. I'll leave it up to the audience to figure out what that is. I've already given them a big hint, but uh, some people don't like those hints, and, and that's okay. Make up your own. But uh, the fact is, that was uh, the next part of the event was he uh, decided to um, come toward me, paralyzed me at that point. And when he when he did, I was uh, I fell back on the bed. I was so shocked. I'd never felt fear like that in my entire life. I mean, the fear was horrific. I fell back on the little bed and I pushed so hard against the bed so he couldn't get near me. The bed split, uh, moved apart from the wall, the little tiny cot, and uh, it pushed the bed apart. And I fell down and bounced my little head off the floor. And it was a ki- every kid's nightmare. It picked up the covers of the bed and lifted them up and stuck its huge head under the bed right next to my face. Mm. And, uh, boy, that was just horrific. And it, the image he projected, he didn't shape shift. The image he projected to me was that of a clown, a pure white face clown with red hair, with large eyes. And th- th- many abductees have uh, phobias of clowns and they have no idea where they came from. I'll give you a hint. And I kept shaking my head, no, 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 no. And I wouldn't, I would not focus on that. He tried to get me to focus as hard as he could so that I would wake up in the morning having, remembering that I had a dream of a, of a bad dream of a clown. In other words, there was no alien. It didn't happen. So I would doubt my own self. But I knew what it was and I wanted to remember him for what he was and the clown he really was, not the clown he wanted me to think he was. So um, the, uh, the, the fascinating and the most important part of the story for me was this. I learned how, uh, probably quite accidentally, uh, are you familiar with the concept when they, on TV, especially in political situations, they have something they call a hot mic? Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. when a hot mic is when the mic is on and it's not supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And everybody can still hear. I, burn, I found out how to hot mic these guys so I can still listen to him. Like when he talked to me at first, he said, it's awake. I can still hear him talking, though he shuts me off. I can still hear them thinking. This is why I learned so much about the alien over the years. Is that something you just learned over the years? That No, I actually learned how to do that. At age four, accidentally, I'm sure. I mean, I didn't figure it out, I don't think. Uh, but I've even tested it uh, several years ago when we were up on the snowmass wilderness with seven investigators. And we had one of them. He gets abducted every year up here. So we took him, placed him in the middle of our encampment and uh, next to a cliff. And uh, we had someone sitting there all night in front of his, right in front of his door of his tent all night long. He would sit there every night. He was a commercial airline pilot. And uh, all of us were strategically placed. And uh, long story short, the alien finally showed up on the seventh night of uh, our encampment. And everybody's pretty much wore out and tired and everything. Uh, but anyway, I, I I had a hard time sleeping because uh, the, we were so high up in the snow mass wilderness, it's uh, it's hard to breathe. I mean, it's it's uh, it really had an effect on me. So I was awake most of the time, and I saw the alien come by my tent, and I saw the light on the outside. That we had a big lantern right there next to the guy in front of the tent, uh, and that lantern lit up the alien and gave his shadow on my tent. And I wanted to see if I could still hot mic him, and I could, and it would. Ab- I was absolutely amazed that I could figure out what was in his thinking. And the the fact is, nothing was in there. Only what they were telling him to do was coming through. That was so bizarre. So the skill of hot micing is something that uh, can be taught, in my opinion. 
and we've used it in different events before. One of our abductees, a lady who uh, was horrified that her children were going to get taken because they threatened her if she gave me more any more information, they were going to come get her kids. And uh, so I worked with her uh, to defend herself, and she actually tore the eye cover off the alien on two different occasions and found under the eye cover a, a red uh, stippled screen of six little white lion, lions running back and forth across the red stippled screen. Something you might see in something biomechanical in a, like in a laboratory. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to help support Beyond Forbidden and receive extra content that's not seen anywhere else? By becoming a patron, a few things you will receive are the full length 90 minute or 120 minute podcast episode. Members will also receive a private link of the video podcast and will only be exclusive to Patreon members. In-person, face-to-face interviews with some of the most well-known, respected researchers. Behind-the-scenes footage of interviews not seen anywhere else. And that's just a few perks. So what do you have to lose? Cut out one brain-rotting, overly processed happy meal a month that doesn't do anything beneficial for your mind, body, and spirit. And become a Patreon for just five bucks.